Very, very good. Here we go. Hey, welcome to the Commerce Hero Show. I'm joined today by Eric Hansen. Again, Eric, this is your second time on the show in the last couple of weeks of Classy Llama. Uh, Eric, hey, how are you doing? Doing great. Hey, how are you, man? Doing good, doing good. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about your uh, innovation award, the Magento Innovation Lab, I think is what it's called. Uh, That's right. For the work you did with the uh, custom cable builder stuff for one of your clients at Classy Llama, uh, show me cables. Yes. So um, that'll be that should be cool. So what? So uh, what, t tell us a little bit about what what the solution is that you guys built. Sure. So uh, show me cables. They're a company based in St. Louis, uh, actually a little bit outside of St. Louis. Uh, they came to us uh, about two and a half years ago, wanting to replatform over to Magento too. Um, they had a number of custom, both B2B and B2C requirements, uh, but one of the big features that they wanted was the ability for anyone to come to their site and design a custom cable. So uh, we launched that for them just over a year ago. And when Magento put out a, a call to uh, submit any sort of innovations to them, uh, we're like, hey, this is something that is uh, you know, visually a little bit different. You can go in and configure a, a a custom product. Uh, so we we submitted that to them, and then earlier this year we were selected um, at Imagine. This year uh, they had we gave different presentations um, talking about the different things we built. So I have some slides uh, from that that I think I'll share and just kind of give you a, a live demo of what uh, the cable builder is. Beautiful. Yeah, that'll be good because I. I'd seen kind of a, a write up on it, didn't played with it a tiny bit, um, but this will be cool. So you'll do a screen share here in a, in a bit and uh, we'll just jump right into it to, to kind of learn more about it. Um, good. You so, I mean, me, let, let's do that right now. <laughs> let's jump right I into it. All right. Okay. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Oh, let me click on to it so it doesn't click back over to me. Yes, looks good. About show me cables. All right. So I, I am shamelessly stealing my slides from Imagine. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So I mean, show me cables founded in '95. Uh, they have 10,000 cable related products and they're based in St. Louis. So that gives them quick delivery to either coast. Uh, I'm just going to skip that slide. So they sell a lot of, of cable related products. Cables, bulk wiring cable. Uh, so, so they work primarily with uh, installers, technicians, people that use this in a professional context. And so one of the things that those people run into is that your off the shelf, say like your Cat5 cable is gonna work for a lot of applications, but there are a number of the time where you can either say, I'm gonna custom build this out on the field, or if I have a lot of these cables that I need, I can just go to show me cables and custom design this cable. Uh, so, um, wh when you say, uh, when you say a cu custom build this on the field versus, could you flesh that out a little bit? The two. Sure. So, I mean, building cables is, is something that, uh, a lot of professionals have the ability to do. They can go in and crimp the wires, uh, you know, strip, strip them down, put the connector on. Right. Um, it's not something that requires like special, uh, right. tools or equipment that they could just do out in the field. So, so theoretically they could build this themselves, but there's kind of that opportunity cost that so they could either be doing installations or building the custom cables themselves and then doing the installs. And so a lot of those installers say, yeah, we want to just go ahead and order those pre-made. Got it. Okay. Okay. I actually did some cable crimping back in my day, believe it or did not. Did you? Did you get everything yes. right? Ah, yeah, more or less. More or less. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it would have been a lot better if I could have used this tool. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of use cases. So... Uh, if someone's going in and doing an install and they're, they're wiring up a server room, you know, you don't want it to look like this. Um, Correct. that's just terrible. There's that both like it, a hot mess. It really does. <laughs> uh, this is how most technicians feel about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, not only is it terrible, like organize it also any additional length of cable. That's not, uh, that's not necessary. You can have issues with signal dropping and that's, so you want to have things just the right length. Mm -hmm. Um, and the second use case is there's one of the Show Me Cables, their installers, uh, they were helping Kohl's 
uh, get cell coverage inside of their buildings because these buildings are, are are concrete and steel and a cell signal just does not reach inside there. So mm -hmm. they had a little antenna uh, with a, a booster or repeater inside. Um, the problem is there's no off the shelf cable that will connect these two devices. Okay. So either they have to build it out in the field themselves or they can go to uh, show me cables and uh, design a cable. So I'm gonna flip over right now uh, and take a look. Are you able to see the cable builder yeah. on the screen here? Yeah. So there's two options. Well, first let me just, we'll just start on the homepage. Um, you know, cable build, custom cable building is a pretty big part of their site. So they advertise it here on the homepage. We'll hop in, start building a custom cable. And there's kind of two things you can do. You can either design a custom cable or there is the ability to hop in and, and spe like send a form and, and kind of the old school way of doing it before they had a cable builder. Um, right. Which I'll just pull that up to show you. This is kind of what a lot of sites do is they have, to, you just have to go in and say, there's what I want in connector A, connector B, send that in, and then you have to wait a day or two to get a custom quote. And that's interesting because within B2B, you're always dealing with, you're trying to create a better new workflow, but you're also trying to sort of respect the previous workflows and not completely, you know, not completely force them all at once. So you've kind of got these nice two options. They can do it the old school way, or they can save themselves some time and, and do it the new way. Exactly. And there are, there's, there's kind of some flows that will drop them into the form, which I'll show you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of their old way of doing it. The new way you basically hop in here, select a usage. So you have different categories like ethernet, coaxial, fiber, video, audio. For our example, we're going to go with coaxial, um, just because there's a lot of different connectors that you could you could tack onto a coaxial cable. Uh, so we'll just scroll on down this list here. Um, there's all kinds of different cables. One of the things that we ran into is that there's a uh, there was kind of like a technical explanation for some of these, and then a mm. more layman's term. Um, so we had we added support so they could have both of those so that if you depending on what you referred to it as you you could identify that product gotcha so we'll go in here and we'll select this tnc mail cable connector uh we're going to go in and select a type so depending on whether you need it to be indoor outdoor what kind of you know if you're going to bury the cable uh, if you're going to do a really long run you might need a thicker a thicker cable so we're going to go in and just choose this uh rg6 outdoor And then connector B, uh, we'll choose this TNC female. So you can see here is a kind of a rough visualization of what we've built. Obviously, it's not to scale. Uh, come in here and we'll plug in a cable length. Let's say we need this to be 150 feet, um, six inches. And how would they normally, like, what's the alternative to this? Would they just sort of browse through like hundreds of different options and combinations of types of cables with yeah, different angles. Certainly. And, and they do, you know, show me cables does have categories where you can go in um, and choose from any of these different types and you can use layered navigation to filter down what you're looking for. But for a lot mm -hmm. of these people, the custom requirements, especially when it comes to different connectors on Eden, you're mm -hmm. not going to find an off the shelf cable that has that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Got it. So, you know, we've come in here, we specify the length, um, connector label, you can come in here and, and type in uh, extender, and that kind of visualizes right here. They basically will label each end. So if, if you're, especially if it's useful if you're doing a custom length cable that has the same ends, um, you, you might have like a different colors on each side, um, and you can label that. So nice. Makes it a little bit simpler, especially if you're, you have some help that's working, you know, pull the cables, it, it makes it pretty foolproof. And then uh, this is special instructions if you want to say, you know, uh, please make sure labels are really visible. I don't know. What, I don't, there's a lot of different things that people type in there. Um, so then we proceed to the next step. And you know, over here on the left-hand side, we have all the information that we've entered. Um, here we have a pricing table showing how much it's going to cost at, at the different quantity breaks. Uh, we we, right. we wanted to make sure that there was a permalink to every custom cable. So this link right here, if you copy this, um, it'll for years into the future, you can load this exact configuration, which I will demonstrate by just opening that in a new tab. Oh, nice. How are you generating? Is that just, an, a, do you just generate a unique record for each custom, custom yeah, uh, I, cable? 
Exactly. Yeah. And we, we made sure we, the, that's not creating a custom product in Magento. That's actually a separate database table so that we didn't clutter the database with, you know, a lot of products, but, uh, right. ultimately you go in and you add this to your shopping cart. Um, then it basically sticks it on a custom cable and all of those options are stuck on there as custom options. So that made it really easy from a, from a product management standpoint. Nice. Um, and so some of the other features here, of course, you can email this to yourself. Send me a little email. Share it um, on Snapchat, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there's no Facebook or any of those things here. This is not really case for that. Of course, you can hop in here, print it. A lot of people do that if they're if they're making a bid, um, if they're working with their end customer. And one of the things that we did is we included this little checkbox: include price it, pricing when emailing printing. Um, and if I uncheck that and then I go to print all of the pricing information, you probably won't be able to see it, but we basically stripped out all the pricing information. Mm. So that way they can mark it up or they don't need to make, maybe they just don't want to have pricing displayed. So, right. Nice. Yeah. And then at any point, if they've said, oh, we did something wrong, we want to hop back in here, change something, we'll go in here and change the connector, proceed to the next step. And now we've built, proceed to the next step. And now we've built, this configuration is now incremented um, and it's a different configuration. Right. So if somebody goes in, if I go in and, and create uh, with, with my own customer session and I create the same type of cable with the same options, would it, would it use that same URL or would yeah, it no, just create? I got that same question at the Imagine presentation. No, it creates a new one just because uh, we, we didn't want to spend the development time to try to dedupe it. Um, right. and because there was a potential for maybe having a special instructions or some variance there, it didn't really, wasn't the value in, in, um, in doing that, but gotcha. that certainly would be an, inter an interesting idea. So, nice. yeah, and there's some, a couple other things, ethernet, there's a lot more options when it comes to connectors uh, or sorry, when it comes to cable types, you only have actually a couple different connectors. Um, but then cable types, you have either a cat five E or cat six. And then within that, you have a lot of different color options. So we kind of created a custom design layout here. Um, including like Cat5 e stranded, Cat5 e solid, and then you had a uh, text description describing what that's good for. So for people that are more consumers coming in designing a custom cable, um, that's what they use that for. Nice. So very cool. Yep. How does and this? Then, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. One more thing I was going to show you about the the other. So if I come in here and select other, that is where we actually drop them into the that custom form. So if I click next step here, it's going to be because you chose other as one of your options, you have to use like the custom cable request form. And then you and you get shoved over into that form with those options. Any of the options that you selected, those got pre-filled. Cool. Yeah. Nice. How did so how does this compare to some of the other uh, I don't know too much about this particular industry myself, so I'm not sure what competitors do, but how does this compare to what other competitors in their space have, have done? Yeah, great question. So uh, it's been a year or so since I went in out and reviewed all the competitor sites, but they were probably a decade behind in terms of uh, their technology. And some of them had visualizers, but they were just very clunky, really slow. Mm. Um, so, you know, even though I, I, I think uh, I was talking with uh, someone about this innovation and, and comparing it to some of the other innovations that were selected as a part of the innovations lab that were doing things with, you know, a chat bot or AI. And, and this is certainly not a sexy innovation. And you might even say, well, this really isn't an innovation, but um, what it did for show me cables and what, what it's doing for their business is just fantastic. Um, and it's a very practical application of building a customization on top of Magento. Um, so I wanted to actually just flip over and quickly just cover, uh, we talked about some of the benefits to the customers, you know, you get the visual confirmation of what you've built. You can customize the cable quickly, dynamic pricing, a permanent link to the custom cable. Um, you know, we built this on top of Magento. We, we created a custom product type. We built a lot of pricing into, into, uh, the pricing calculator. We, we feed the cost into Magento and then, Magento, okay. and then we, and then, Show me cable said, "Hey, here's the profitability we want on these different types of configurations," and it comes up with the price to the to the customer. Oh, cool! Yeah, 
And, and you just like feed that in from their ERP or something like that? Um, yes. And and then all the product information is ultimately stored in Magento and it comes from the cost field on that on those individual products. Um, and everything we built gotcha. was using products in Magento. So they're able to go in and add new con connectors, cable types, and all of that without involving a developer. Cool. Yeah. So you end up with server rooms that look like this. Hey, that looks better. <laughs> Much better. Uh, and the, those installers that need those custom cables can now build that uh, with the cable builder. So the, the most exciting thing I think for Show Me Cables was that their custom cables they sell are two to four more profitable than other products on the site. Uh, and they can use them to capture a, a lifetime customer and, and have those customers coming back for other more standard products beyond just a custom cable. Now, and that and that profitability was before and after the 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 new cable builder tool was launched. So you know they they actually before we built the cable builder for them, we didn't build it like completely from scratch, brand new. They did have a former iteration of it, uh, which Rick CV is the CTO from Show Me Cables. He was there at the talk, and he said that it was like what we built for them versus what they had it was kind of a night and day difference. Their old one was really clunky, really slow, um, but they did already have that. So I don't actually have stats about like from nothing to custom cable, but I just know comparing what people are doing now versus their other uh, off the shelf products, it is two to four times more profitable. That's cool. Yeah. And That's then cool. and then for people to go through that process, there's a 24% conversion rate. That's just nuts. So when, so that, so somebody Google, like Google, like where, do you know where that traffic is coming from? Is that just all different channel traffic channels? Yeah, I don't have that pulled up and I've not looked at it recently, so I couldn't tell you. But they I mean, there's some pretty strong intent. Like this, like they're they're a professional, they gotta get the job done. They they probably know they wanna go with that with show me cables. They just get in there and they get it done. Yeah, and exactly. That's... And and by the time they get to the end of this process, they're fairly committed. You know, they've taken if they've not done the tool, it's probably taken them five or ten minutes to go through, look at all the options. Um, but still that conversion rate like is really huge for show me cables compared to like the average industry. <laughs> you know, conversion rates of like one to 4%, um, that's pretty huge for them. So. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I'd be curious to know whether they had any data on how, um, uh, you know, they're transitioning from, you know, kind of the older uh, model of uh, doing things, um, you know, where m the more manual model. And like you said, they have this pre had this previous iteration that wasn't very good. Um, but I'd be curious if there's any data on like how how um, how well are they transitioning people over to use the new tool? How much usage is it getting and how much like time are they saving? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, internally on their own employee resources. Um, yeah, those are, that's a great question. I don't really have a, <laughs> I don't have answers to those. Maybe maybe I should have pulled Rick on from Show Me Cables, but we'll get some follow up questions for him. That's all yeah, good. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I, by the way, I switched back to video so people can see our faces now. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Um, one one interesting stat they found was I think when they when we built the cable builder for them they they kind of had this idea that most people were using it to come up with a cable that had unique endings. Um, we ran some stats a few months ago and we actually found out that the majority of people were building like networking cables with the same ends on them that were just custom lengths. Uh, and I think roughly two thirds of the people were building those ones with identical ends. So. That's actually kind of driven some uh, some design changes on their main website. Because right now, if you go to a configurable product for a Cat5 cable, you can choose like one foot, three foot, five foot, 10 foot, 25, you know, 50, 100. Uh, we're going to be adding a new swatch option that's custom length. Uh -huh. And then whenever a user selects, selects that, it'll kind of feed them into the, the cable builder experience. Um, because we're finding that a lot of people are wanting those custom length cables. Got it. And just feed them in with some of the options pre-populated, and just let them pick the, exactly. the length. Yep. Nice. That's really cool. Um, how did the idea for for this for this tool come up? I think it just came out of like uh, filling out a form where there's no immediate feedback visually or of pricing is not a great experience. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they've been be, they've been online selling for 12 or 15 years. So Rick CV, the guy that, that we've worked with in the 
on this project. Um, it was a brainchild. It wasn't something where we were like, hey guys, build this custom cable builder. Uh, mm. And so we would, we just worked with him on the design process, came up with some prototypes of, you know, how do we improve on this? How do we make it a great experience? Um, you know, obviously we also wanted to make sure that it was works well on a mobile device. Although looking at stats, that is still a pretty small percentage of people that are doing it on a mobile device, but we expect that to be more and more over time. Of course, uh, installers yeah. out in the field knowing, Hey, I can do this on a mobile phone and maybe they don't complete the purchase on their mobile, but they can at least add it to their cart and you know check out right. later. Right. Right. Um, it's cool. I mean, just this whole topic around innovation, particularly for B2B, it's like you said, where chatbot or AI or anything like that, but it's this br kind of bread and butter innovation that is driving, you know, uh, sales and productivity for B2B, um, organizations that is, uh, is really pretty interesting. I mean, yeah. um, and I think we're going to see, we'll see a lot more of this. Do you guys have any other areas of, of innovation in a similar category for other clients that are, that are, yeah, we do. I, I have a project for a client right now. They're a distributor. Um, they sell, they sell to a lot of big box stores like Lowe's tractor supply company, um, but also to smaller dealers. Uh, it's kind of in the lawn and garden uh, space mm -hmm. and it's just, and it's really amazing to see how a lot of these businesses are still kind of stuck in the stone ages where they're, submitting, you know, a PDF PO or maybe even faxing in a purchase order. Uh, and when we work with these companies say, hey, let's move you move you to, to a web interface where a B2B customer can go on, upload a CSV or even just quickly add items to their shopping cart and build that all on the web. Uh, how much work that eliminates both from that customer purchasing as well as the, the merchant themselves that are having like the, the human error element of manually entering a PO is just gone. Um, right. So that's one thing we're seeing a lot is even like things that, that consumers have taken for granted on the web for, for probably a decade. A lot of B2B businesses ha are just now getting into e-commerce and just now enabling like the full online order events. So yeah. for them, it feels like an innovation, even though we take it for granted and have for, for really since the beginning of Magento. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, what what are some of uh, what are some of your general takeaways for uh, helping companies work through digital transformation, helping them figure out how to transition from manual processes to online processes? What are some of the general trends that you're seeing? So I think prototyping is really useful, um, especially because you can write. You know, ultimately, when we build something before we go to code, we we will tend to have a fully written spec. But before that, getting in, uh, we use Envision for prototyping. So like our, our UX designer uh, working with like a technical person will come up with, hey, here's what that workflow needs to look like. Um, and we'll build an interactive prototyper, you know, working with a fully baked interface. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding that to be really useful for getting, you know, stakeholder feedback uh, from that visual interface that you, you would never get if you made them read through a five-page technical document. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's a that's a yeah. pretty big one for us. I think is just making sure that we anything that's at all visually oriented, we have that prototype. Research with these companies, helping you know to figure out where are the best places to innovate, where you know where does it make sense to transition processes over. Do you guys have yeah. A good? Process? Yeah, I think for merchants where we have that ongoing relationship, a lot of times it tends to be just kind of more organic, ad hoc. We're like, hey, let's you know let's focus on improving this area. We go in. We look at the the Google Analytics, uh, the date, you know, run some custom queries in the database. Um, that's I would say that's probably the majority of use cases. And then we do have some merchants where we go in and say, hey, we want to have an ongoing, uh, you know, conversion rate optimization, A/B testing, uh, and we go through and on a more regular basis are making recommendations for improvements, trying out experiments. Um, right. But I would say that's probably the minority of the merchants that we work with that are sophisticated enough and have a large enough site where that makes sense for them to, to do those micro optimizations. Right, right, right. Um, what, what was the uh, what was the process of the of the award, getting the award, applying for the award? Uh, what was that whole process like? How have they? I know I saw the blog posts and things like that, but I think about the master's program, how they promote the master's in lots of different places and venues and give it a lot of visibility. What's the, what's that process been like of getting the award? And, and yeah. So, 
So Michelle Miller is kind of been the one driving that over at Magento. Um, and she did a really good job of getting the word out uh, before Imagine, uh, kind of for this first round of Innovations Lab, um, which they just did a second round that closed, I think, maybe a month ago. Um, and I think really what she's wanted to do is highlight the innovations of people built that, that they've built on Magento. Because you can go to a lot of the top partner websites, and you can look through portfolios. And you can see a lot of really beautiful websites um, that that are visually impressive, but a lot of times you don't get to see the things that are being done that are kind of more on the the forefront of um, on Magento, and maybe not even out in production settings yet. You know, some of the, the innovations that were selected, I think, are more kind of proof of concept. Um, right. So it was a, a really simple process. We basically just submitted, I think, some screenshots, kind of a basic write up of uh, what what the Showman Cable's Cable Builder was. And then they had had an internal selection process where they went through and said, hey, here's the things that we deem worthy of being an innovations lab entry. Um, so I would definitely recommend for people, you know, when a round three of innovation labs inevitably comes up, if you have something that's, that you feel like is uh, an innovation that's worthy of being seen by others, get, you know, get out there and apply. Um, and they're very eager to have uh, developers, merchants, uh, systems integrators submitting to the innovations lab. All right, so then you just pay them a little something under the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and where where have they kind of promoted the, uh, like what kind of promotion have you sort of gotten? Yeah, so um, at Imagine there was an innovations lounge where uh, they had some screens set up, uh, kind of demoing the different videos that people had of the innovations. Uh, and I think at, at different points, they encourage people to go and, and check out the innovations. And you know, I, every merchant is going to be looking for something different. Um, so whenever we gave the presentation at Imagine, we were giving it alongside uh, Proficient, uh, who's a systems integrator, and uh, Loom Decor. And Proficient built like a scene seven visualizer for uh, Loom Decor, which is really impressive. I'd, I recommend you guys going and checking it out uh, on the Innovations Lab page. But we kind of did a presentation together. Um, and then after that, after the talk, people came up and, and were like, oh yeah, like." We have something on Magento, or what we're wanting to build something on Magento. You know, what do you guys recommend us? Do you think we should use bundle products as a foundation or group products? Um, and even people that we're not even going to be like working with, I think, just kind of cross pollinating ideas and saying, "Hey, like, here's how we did this. You can go look under the hood, even some of the stuff that we've built, um, and take a cue from that." And and so yeah, I think, and then also they've you know written blog posts about it. And they really want to kind of push the fact that Magento is a platform on which you can build anything. Right, right. Um, do do you think that the kind of their effort around the innovation lab is helping to drive innovation in the community? Um, I don't know that it's it's driving it. I think it's more just shining. Um, so yeah, I think mainly it's just shining a spotlight on it. Okay. Okay. And were you able to get some good leads out of it, or? Yeah, I think we have a couple that are that are protect prospective leads. Okay, yeah. nice, beautiful. Yeah. Um. Cool, man. Well, this one might be nice, short and sweet, because you had a very, very efficient uh, presentation, and we got through all of that really nicely. Um. And uh, I'm not sure if I have too many other questions. Was there anything else that that would make sense to to cover on this topic? Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'd imagine they they time box me ten minutes. <laughs> right. So I was like, how can I get all this information across in ten minutes? So we've been talking for thirty minutes, uh, which is three times the amount of time that I had. So I mean, I, I would just say Magento is a fantastic platform to build a customization on. Um, you know. Go out, check out the other innovations lab entries. There's some out there that are pretty cool. Um, and then if you're, you know, if you're one of those people that have built something that's that's an innovation, the next time they do a, a round of entries, get out there and uh, apply because it's a great opportunity. Nice. And actually, by the way, um, were you? Um, who was the team at Classy that that worked on this? So it's called the Dream Team is the name of the team. Uh, okay. You guys my, have names for everything. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Every team has their own name. So uh, it was myself, Tombs. He did a lot of the development. Uh, Chris Nanaga. Um, I think those were the primary developers working on it. Uh, but then uh, Richard Cisco, Sean Templeton, Steven, Viston, are a couple of other guys on the team. Okay. Nice. And what, what were some of the most challenging things about building it? 
Um, I think determining the initial architecture, so whether to use Knockout or potentially a React or Vue versus a more like old school custom JavaScript way of, of doing it. Um, we opted for Knockout just because that's what Magento uses in their checkout and several other places. And we didn't really want to introduce another library. Um, and that uh, required for performance reasons, we just built a JSON object of all of the connectors and cables um, rather than loading it asynchronously, uh, which is what we had kind of initially had planned on doing. So we have a, a decent sized JSON object that's, that's, if you look at the source of the page, you can see all that data there. Um, that's all cached in, in full page cache. And as a result of that, when you load the page, it's a, it's a really fast experience and it doesn't have to pull in any extra assets. Um, mm -hmm. One of the issues that we ran into though is uh, we built the cable with a certain amount of sample data. It was not the full, it wasn't representative of all of the connectors and all of the possible combinations. So once we got, once the client went in and imported all that data, we ran into some performance issues that we had to really nail down and it ended up being some bugs in Knockout. Uh, so we had to scratch those bugs and everything was fine. But I would say kind of a lesson learned was as much as possible, no matter what you're building, like don't go with just little small sample data, try to get a, rep a representative full set of data that you can build on top right. of. Right. That will, that'll that'll uh, highlight performance issues a lot more quickly. That's a good one. Yeah, the devil's always in the data when you're doing stuff like that. Um, yep. How did so when you guys were looking at knockout versus maybe React or Vue? When was that architectural decision made rel relative to some of the announcements around like PWA Studio? Sure. Yeah, it was it was quite a bit before that. So. We really, I don't think, had any insight into the fact that you know React was going to be part of the future of Magento. Um, right, right. And so, if I think if we had known that in hindsight, we probably would have been much more inclined to go with a React. Since that was no my next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, that's interesting. And are you guys starting to? Uh, are you guys starting to pull React into into your projects? I not yet actually. We're we're close. Um, I think it's the the number of things that we build like this that are really conducive to pulling in a a you know a front end JavaScript library um, are not as common as like doing customizations to the existing framework. So I certainly anticipate within the next year uh, pulling in React, knowing that's kind of the future of Magento. Right. And um, how's it been for for you? Um, I assume your background is like as a well, you've done a lot. I mean, you started the agents, helped to co-found the agent management and team leadership. But um, as a developer, I assume you've been most mostly your background has been as a, a back end developer. Um, PHP. It's probably, it's probably been like forty percent front end, sixty back end, more back end recently. Um, I think early on, I did a lot of front end, and then I kind of gravitated more towards the back end, just because I find that to be more interesting. At least yeah. I did. I did eight years ago. Now, with all the stuff that's happening on front end, it's like, wow, they're now both like complex, like very ar you know architecturally driven, um, and they're now kind of equally compelling. At least the JavaScript side of front end, not so much like just doing like, you know your theming. Right, and that was the question I was going to ask: is what's that learning curve been like? Uh, with Knockout JS or some of these other things, and and how are you liking it? Um, I think that the documentation for any large library, even though Knockout is now you know not not as popular as like React, there's still a lot of documentation out there. I think it's the intersection between how Knockout works versus Magento's implementation of it, where there's a lot of details lacking. And when we built this, Magento was still Magento two hadn't come out you know fairly recently, and so a lot of issues we ran into. We were the ones kind of uh, pioneering that, if you will, and figuring out those issues and you know coming up with the solutions for them. Whereas now, you know, two and a half, three years after Magento two came out, a lot of those things are already been out there and are published. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the learning curve now is not so bad. Of course, I think within the next year or two, we're going to have another round of learning curve of Magento shifting to you know a PWA right. Studio. Right. Um, I think you might have said this early on, but what was the time frame that you were actually working on this project? So the overall project, I think, was about four and a half, five months. Um, the The amount of time that we spent on this was actually pretty minimal. I think it was about a single the time for like a single developer. I think was about two months worth of time. So, okay. Yeah. 
And when when did that occur? Like, was that? Uh, that was I think about a year and a half ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So still a good number of knockout sort of core Magento knockout bugs that were being hammered out then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for uh, I think the whole PWA studio topic is interesting. I mean, while while we're here, um, we we've sort of touched on it a little bit. But how are you? How are you envisioning that learning curve going? And and how are you guys uh, preparing for it? How are you guys thinking about you know getting your devs over the M two front end learning curve and then Java? You know, and also I think I don't know if you, I think we mentioned this before we started recording, but you're going to be helping out with the JavaScript certification. Yes. Uh, yes. So how how are you guys thinking about that? So I think and it was Andrew, I think Levine um, from the PWA Studio group, he gave some really good advice. He said, right now, if you're wanting to prepare yourself for PWA Studio and the huge shift that's coming on the front end of Magento, he said, start by learning uh, React, Redux, get familiar with those, those technologies in a more vanilla context that's not Magento specific. Um, so that's what we're encouraging our front end devs that, that want to be ready for get ahead and really like learn about all the technologies. We're encouraging them now go in, learn the technologies. And then once we're within probably a few months of being production ready, that's when we're gonna really like ramp it up and say, okay, now we're gonna do team-wide trainings and we're gonna really dig in and, and master these these newer uh, technologies. Got it. And um, when, when in kind of the stage you're at now where like you said, it, it's sort of a recommendation, hey, Go ahead and start to get familiar with React and of in, in, um, in terms of like the way that you your team uh, allocates time for for that thing, um, is that something that you encourage developers to do on the job? Is there uh, during you know work hours? Is there a certain percentage of their day that you say, hey, just spend some time learning React, um, or you know, is that something you encourage people to kind of do on their own time? <laughs> That's a great question. So, because uh, a lot of people feel super overwhelmed, they're like, "Dude, they're like, I have, I have this whole day job, and then I got to learn this whole new technology stack." And they're like, "What, you know, where do I find the time for that?" Yeah, it's a great question. So right now, there's a like within the forty hours at Classy Llama, there's a certain like expectation of billable hours that a developer is going to get within thirty nine point five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not not quite. No. So within that, <laughs> with, there's a little bit of margin there for people to do like small amounts of learning, but certainly not like a multiple days of deep. Uh, unlike a lot of industries, uh, professions that require continual education credits, uh, yeah. as in software engineers, there's no requirements. So it's either individuals are, you know, self-disciplined and they go and do that on their own time. Um, company makes time for that. And, and at Class Lama, you know, we really want to respect that personal work balance. And so when it's necessary, we do make that time for that. Yeah. That's cool. It's funny. I hadn't thought about that analogy to like the industries that have these continual, um, continual learning. Like they have to get certain amount of learning credits. And I think my dad used to do that as a as a community college professor, um, because I I generally I've yep. never had to do that myself. But I generally get the sense that those continuing education credits are sort of BS. Like you just sit through them, but you're not really learning anything. Whereas like yeah. in our industry, like you really got to learn stuff or you're going to get left behind. So it's funny because we don't have that formal structure, but it, it's a much more real uh, dynamic to our industry. Oh, it's so true. And that's something I think about with myself. Uh, being more in a management role, I don't write code all the time. I, I don't write it as much as I would love to. Uh, you know, Karen Baker, she tweeted something about like, all I want to do is write code. And I, I, I replied to her, I was like, yeah, mobile development for 20 years, and they've not kept current, and they haven't eaten other technologies. And, and we have a local, several local development groups here in Springfield, but uh, I try to go to those as often as I can, just because I think it's good to be aware of other technology space in our industry. And I recently was looking at a bunch of like code boot camps. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get a better understanding. I've talked to a few people that are, that have hired from code boot camps and stuff like that. And it's kind of crazy. There's there's like I looked at this list of like the top fifty code boot camps in in the in the world, and I think there was one or two of them that did PHP. Let mm -hmm. alone like a Magento specific. I know there's lots of training. Magento is training. There's lots of training, but like a six month code boot camp 
specific to Magento, I think would be super interesting. Yeah, I um, agree. And we've even thought about doing like for years, we've talked about maybe doing something like that at Classy Llama. I think the challenge for us would is like, if we're going to do that primarily for like Classy Llama employees is like getting a group of new developers to start at a time so that you could kind of bring them through that together rather than staggering it. Once you start getting staggered, if people at different process, like different places in their learning process, then it's like, okay, um, that's kind of hard to do that in a bootcamp style. So yeah. for Classy Llama, what, I've, what I really believe in is for how we train people is we kind of have more of a like apprentice model where we bring in somebody and there's a, a more senior developer that kind of takes them under their wing and says, hey, like, you know, here's here's PHP, here's Magento, go through these, uh, all of this, whether it's recorded videos or I prefer written uh, technical training. Everyone, everyone learns differently, but like go through that. Within a couple of weeks though, we start bringing them into production projects and start, you know, giving them either they're shadowing somebody develop that's already developing and then they get passed over and say, here, do these very well-defined tasks. Um, but we really try to get them writing code in, in production projects um, as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. What is, what is that shadowing uh, apprentice pro apprenticeship process look like? Like how closely uh, are they working with the people that they're apprenticing under? No, that's a great question. So we, I mean, even in physical proximity, we actually sometimes will even move desks so that new people can sit next to the person that they're working with. And it's, it's not something that's like a hundred percent across all of class of we do that, but there tends to be kind of that one person that's responsible for bringing them up. Um, and they even have time allotted in their schedule. But like, Hey, if you don't, if you need to do less billable work this week, just to get this person up and invest in them, it's absolutely worth it. And I, I really try to take a long-term view of people like anybody that we bring onto the team, I think, okay, they're going to be here five, hopefully 10 years. And if you have that view on people, then the amount of time you're going to invest in them and, and like, bring them up early on is going to be so much more <laughs> engagement. Um, how much it's, it's just an interesting topic to me right now. And uh, one of the, I, one of the things I've heard from people before is that everybody sort of in theory likes this idea of, um, um, apprenticeship and things like that, helping out junior developers. Um, and it's interesting you talked about allotting time because I've heard some people say they've been in a scenario where it's like, okay, here's a new team member take some time to mentor them, but then product, maybe their productivity takes a hit uh, and then they're getting yelled at, right? That, and so it's like, well, what, you know, you can't have both. Like either I'm gonna allot some time to help this person or I'm gonna allot that time to get my work done. So yep. I'm curious like how much, how you structure that, like how much time do you tell them to, to allot? Uh, yeah, in there. no, that's good. So I think, uh... I think finding the people that want to have a heart to teach others, I think is important. So that's one thing we do. And, and with those people, you do have to put some sort of constraints in place. So I think we kind of just say like, like rule of like thumb. Okay. If someone's brand new and you're going to work with them, maybe in a given week, just don't spend more than like eight hours of the 40 hours working with them. And then maybe in the coming weeks, maybe just five. And if you need to spend more than five, you just kind of run it by me. Um, just so that they're not spending like an hour or they're not spending 20 hours. Cause you could, someone yeah. that's passionate about teaching could easily spend half their week. And I think you, in some ways you start getting diminishing returns. Right. right. If there, since there's so many resources out there right now for learning different things, it might take that person, you know, 20, 30% longer to learn. Um, mm -hmm. If they're not being have like 30 hours of hands-on attention. But if, if you can get done, what well, you would spend 30 hours of a senior developer doing and they can get it done in 10 hours or five hours. I think there's a good trade off there. Yeah, no, that's a cool, that's a cool structure. I'm just selfishly asking these questions here because I'm <laughs> kind of interested, but anyways, um, but anyways, um, it was really cool. Again, congratulations on the, on the award and uh, where can people find out more about classy llama or find you uh, online? Classy llama.com. Uh, my Twitter is Eric Hansen, E R I K H A N S E N. So yeah, well, beautiful. It was good chatting with you, Kalen. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much, and yeah. thanks.